Union of Devils, I say. Welcome to Mistropolis, where we gather, talk about crimes, conspiracies, mysteries, and all that jazz. I'm a true crime fan. If you're a fan girl or a fan boy obsessing over true crime, come on in. I was waiting for you. Hi, welcome. I'm so glad you're here for the fourth part of Laurie Vallow and her five husbands. Part three, I'll refresh your memories. We discussed personal life and financial standings of the Vallow couple, circumstances that greatly influenced Laurie and Charles' separation. We also dug deep into what could have been a possible motive or multiple motives behind Charles Vallow's death. In last episode, I pointed out why Laurie might have gone to Houston and why she came back to Arizona with JJ. It was also to keep Charles under the impression that everything is okay and also to lure Charles to Arizona through JJ. That's what I think. In fact, the very day of Charles' death on July 11, 2019, the hotel staff was expecting Charles and JJ back for the breakfast and later he was scheduled to look for an apartment for himself to stay close to his family. The source is a Facebook post by the landlord he was supposed to meet, but the post was deleted shortly after, so take this with grain of salt. If we go back few months back in January of 2019, when Chad made the revelation, the, uh, the great revelation that Charles is a dark spirit, she cancelled his flight from Houston to Phoenix and stole his truck from the airport, if you remember that. Why I think she cancelled his flight from Texas to Arizona is, hear this, Chad, Chad Daybell predicted that Charles will die in a road accident while coming from Texas. This could be the reason, don't you think? Like, how did he know? Oh yeah, he's a prophet and all that. Lori received a revelation that Charles was supposed to die in an accident on his way home from Texas. Correct. He didn't die. So what was her reaction at that point? Well, I asked her, I'm like, why didn't he die? You, you were told he was supposed to die. Why didn't he die? And she said, well, I, I think she went to Chad and asked because she, I don't think she knew the answer to that. And so he let her know that um, the accident that was supposed to happen didn't because of people's choices. So when things didn't go according to plan or according to a timing, it was only because of agency and it would change. Oh, it's because somebody changed their agency. Very inconsistent. That clearly didn't work out in January of 2019 because Charles bought a $600 flight ticket to get to Arizona. It was a last minute ticket. Ah, uh, side note, Alex was a truck driver. He did that for a living. At least what I've heard. So if they were planning on making it look like a road accident, maybe they would have succeeded. But we don't know that for sure. And we don't know where Alex was at the time. Just a theory, not a fact. So, But we do know for a fact that Alex was called to stay the night at Laurie's house on 10th July 2019. Listen to this. A night of 10th July 2019 that led to the morning Charles was shot. Well, that was no coincidence. And the night before Charles died, didn't she call Alex and say, come and stay with me? Do you know? Mm -hmm. She did. Yeah. And then the next day, Alex shot Charles. What do you think? I had that part of me was like, well, why is he coming to get you and kill you? Like, I don't understand why Charles wants to kill you. She told you Charles showed up to kill her. That was his way. He was coming down from Texas to kill her, mm -hmm. and that's why she had called Alex the night before to come over to the house, mm -hmm. and that he shot Charles mm -hmm. in self-defense. Correct. You knew, though, that she had told you months earlier that Charles was possessed of a zombie. Correct. So did you think, well, there's more here? Right, because if he's coming down, that's why I'm like, well, what, you know, like, as, as a person that would perceive, the public wouldn't perceive him as a zombie, right? Like. What kind of reason could he give anybody for coming down to kill her? Do you know? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so um, she just said, well, they're after me. And I said, well, why? She said, well, for insurance. Like, I have $3 million of insurance on my head. And I'm like, really? She said she had, she had $3 million of insurance on her head. Mm -hmm. Did she ever talk to you about Charles's insurance? 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. What did she say? She said that he had, I think, about a million, and um, that she knew when he passed away that she would get. She thought she'd get the money. So she talked um, about how when Charles dies, I'm going to get a million dollars. I don't know if she was 100% sure because she thought maybe possibly it could have been switched from her to Kay. So she wasn't sure if she was really going to get it or not. But it was something she was thinking about and talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, she did. Alex Cox 100% believed that Charles was a zombie. He was protecting his little sister. But we don't know that. Laurie and Chad may have been using or manipulating this family hitman Alex Cox for their own gain. Not saying Alex is innocent, by no means he was innocent, but he had no personal motive. But Laurie and Chad did. To protect his little sister, Alex attacked and threatened her ex-husband and even served jail time for that. So why wouldn't he remove her estranged husband, Charles Vallow, who in his head thought will harm his sister, Laurie, and was an obstruction in the mission of God. The aftermath of claimed undercoat self-defense shooting, Chandler detective Nathan Moford described the ride in the police vehicle with Laurie, Alex and Tylee as undercoat straight up bizarre. He added, it was the weirdest ride I have ever had with three strangers. He described Laurie as happy-go-lucky and said she was smiling and nonchalant. You would have thought we just discovered their stolen vehicle, he said. Laurie and Alex were detained by police and were released later that day after shooting was determined to be self-defense. Alex got scot free. Laurie, the fresh widow, was ecstatic and couldn't help but crack lame jokes that no one laughed on. Tylee was po possibly coached during the car drive mother and daughter had. I'm sure that happened because Laurie used to manipulate Tylee when she was three years old into telling authorities that she was molested by her father, Joseph Ryan. So why wouldn't she coach her now? Just a speculation. Tylee had no option. She was just a 16-year-old child, so she had to do what her mother is telling her, right? Laurie phones her older son, Colby, around midday and tells him that Charles died of heart attack and Tylee saw him go down and we all had to watch him die. This woman, I tell you. Following the incident, neighbors reported a pool party with loud music at the residence, according to a public post by Joe Poncratz. He was the owner of the property occupied by Laurie. Prangats also said following the days after the shooting, when he spoke to Laurie, quote, she never sounded shocked, sad, or heartbroken. Next day, late afternoon, Laurie texts her two stepsons about the news of death of their father, but doesn't tell them what had actually happened. The text goes, Hi boys, I have a very sad news. Your dad passed away yesterday morning. I'm working on making arrangements and I'll keep you informed with what's going on. I'm still now, now she meant not, sure how to handle things. I just want to want you to know that I love you and so did your dad. In series of messages, she was asked repeatedly what happened, how did this happen and to which she never replied but talked about every BS under the sun. They were not getting any answers from Laurie so Charles' ex-wife Cheryl decided to do her own research because she knew this woman is full of garbage. So she checked medical examiner's webpage and found out that Charles had been killed. On further Google search, she finds out that he was shot by Laurie's brother, Alex Cox. If you remember part 2 of this series, I mentioned how she never bothered to inform the family of her another ex-husband's death for weeks. Joseph Ryan, third husband? Yeah. She has no respect for the dead or their family, and yet she claims and portrays herself as a holy woman who knows all her scriptures and verses. But all her attributes and doing are unholy and vile. No compassion. The best bit. The next day, she wastes no time. This grieving widow calls the insurance company to claim her husband's $1 million policy. And is told, Sorry, we apologize, but your husband kicked you out of it. You're not getting anything. Oh, shit. Laurie was anticipating large sum of money. That didn't happen. She later finds out that the beneficiary was Kay Woodcock, Charles' sister. Rattle Laurie texts Kay, 
five kids and no money and his sister gets everything. Oh, by the way, this is worth mentioning. According to Chad Daybell and Laurie Vallow, Kay Woodcock was a zombie. How convenient, right? At the time of Charles' death, Laurie and Chad had been deeply involved and invested in their romance slash mission of God slash criminal activity. So why not take a divorce, her friend Melanie asked, and to which Laurie said, We can't. It's not allowed. And they were already sealed in temple and have been married in many lives. That BS never gets old. What did she tell you? And she just told me they went together and they felt that they were sealed by those on the other side of the veil that had the authority to do that. So they were in the temple together right. when this happened. Right. Yet she's That's still right. married to Charles and he's still married to Tammy. Correct. And when you would raise this with them, that, hey, you, you're still married, what was their reaction, or at least Lori's, because I'm sure you never had a chance to talk to Chad right. about it. She said that it was okay that they did this because they had been married so many times before that their spouses would understand someday. Lori. They were talking over phone every day. They had separate phones to contact each other, discussing end of times, how they will go about with their missions, how and where they will set up under court white camps for 144,000 and how they will have to get rid of or eliminate the dark souls preventing them from preparing for the second coming of Christ. Not just burner phones, these <laughs> higher beings, the future father and mother of 144,000 had another secretive way of communication. The supreme Chad Daybell with power vested in him created a portal in Lori Vallow's wardrobe. Wow. On July 22, 2019, 10 days after, Lori informs JJ school officials that Charles committed suicide. Compulsive liar, cult mom. Next month, on 5th August, JJ starts his academic year at Life Academy. Four days after she tries to milk out money any way she could. So she tries to sell her autistic son, JJ's dog, Bailey. But she is informed that she can't sell the service dog, but can give it up for adoption. So she's like, oh, well, okay, I'll just give the dog away because my son won't need it anyway. Like he doesn't need his medication. August 10, 2019, JJ has his last 35 second FaceTime with his grandparents Gay Woodcock and Larry Woodcock. Laurie deliberately started keeping JJ away from Gay, maybe because Gay was a zombie, or another more likely and logical reason, Gay got all the money. After this last conversation, Gay Woodcock and Larry Woodcock made several attempts to get in touch with Laurie and talk to JJ, but she never responded. The plan for the Union of Devils was that their respective spouses will be out of picture before they, Laurie and Chad, come together. To put in simpler words, Charles is dead and after Tammy's death, Laurie was supposed to move to Rexburg, Idaho. She prepares to move. August 30, Laurie meets her son Colby at his workplace and informs him that she, Tylee and JJ are moving, but never tells him where, nor he asks strange. Very same day, Colby has his last FaceTime with his sister, Tylee. Then after, he got excuses from Laurie whenever he asked about Tylee. August 31st, Laurie Vallow moves with both the kids to Rexburg, Idaho. There was a FB post by Laurie's former property manager that he asked her to vacate the property by August 31st due to the entire incident involving Charles Vallow's death. This could be the reason why she quickly moved to Idaho. Like, plan was to move after Tammy had passed away. Um, she believed that Tammy was going to pass away, though, before she got up there. And that didn't happen. She didn't pass away before she got up there. And so I thought, you know, I said, aren't you uncomfortable? Maybe he'll see, she'll see you guys together. And so I thought it was different, you know, that she was going to be up there when he, when she was, Tammy was still alive. And she Tylee's friend uh, much later revealed that Tylee wanted to stay back in Arizona but moved for the sake of JJ. Tylee never spoke about her mother's religious belief and said that Laurie got a job in Idaho, which was a lie. Laurie moves into a townhouse on Pioneer Road, Rexburg, just 
ten minutes drive away from her dear Chad. Her brother, her protector, Alex Cox, moves along, and he rents another apartment in the same complex, just two minutes away from his sister. What a close-knit family! Now in Rexburg, they quickly started working on their mission. One of the mission was to get rid of all the zombies before tribulation. On September 3rd, Laurie enrolls JJ at Kennedy Elementary School in Rexburg. On September 6th, a neighbor clicked a picture of Tylee and JJ, which is kind of a stalkery picture, but neighbor said it was because the kids were dumping their soft toys in the puddle and also shared a screenshot to prove uh, that they aren't creepy people watching kids. This photo was taken just 48 hours before Tylee went missing. On September 8, 2019, just a week after they move, Laurie Vallow, JJ Vallow, Tylee Ryan, and Alex Cox visit Yellow, Yellowstone National Park for a pseudo family outing, like since when she started giving F about her kids. So these are the pictures pulled out from Laurie's iCloud account. These pictures are extremely chilling. That day, when she was clicking those pictures, Laurie and Alex knew what they are going to do to Tylee. Nothing was in spur of moment. Everything was planned. Picture of a daughter were a keepsake for Laurie. This cold-blooded woman wanted to remember that day, which is so fucked up how could Laurie look at her daughter and I and pretend to enjoy the last outing. Tylee was supposed to disappear that day and she did. 16 year old Tylee Ryan was seen alive and well for the last time. She was a dark soul according to Chad's list and what happens to dark souls and zombies? We will find the painful truth months after. That day, Tylee vanishes from face of Earth and Laurie never talks about her. No one ever asks about her. Later on, Laurie even goes to the length of telling people that her daughter, Tylee, had died two years ago. Laurie Vallow's other child, JJ, is seen on 17th September playing with a friend in neighbor's doorbell camera. 18 September, Laurie hires a nanny from care.com. Nanny was told about JJ's condition, about how his father died of heart attack, and about Tylee who was at the time going to school at BYU, Idaho. Babysitter later revealed what her conversation with Laurie was like. She explained to me as we watched JJ play outside with neighbor kids. Some of his tendencies, he gets emotional easily, frustrated, distracted, has difficulty communicating with others, but can follow orders if you look at him right in the eye. Laurie mentioned how she got home later to give JJ his medicine right before bed because it makes him tired fast. She joked about how she liked that because some of the days when he was extra tough for her to handle, she would give him his medication. So that he goes to bed early. Such a good mother. Babysitter also noticed that although JJ had a room, it was filled with toys and he slept in his mother's room on a mattress, placed on floor in corner of the room. So this poor kid was put on a floor in one corner. Nanny recalls an incident when JJ was upset. He ran and hid under his mother's bed. He had lost his father, his sister is not around and his mother, only person, he can go to keeps him at an arm's length so i think last few days uh or jj was really hard for him because he was very confused he was in a new place he didn't have people around him that he knew or were close to i just can't imagine it must have been really uh tough for that little kid Following day, Thursday, 19th September, babysitter comes back while Laurie and Alex were leaving for Idaho Falls Airport. An anonymous woman said she had a pleasant conversation with Chad Daybell during a flight on 19th September from Idaho Falls to Mesa, Arizona. So I'm assuming siblings went to see off Chad that day. Same day, Laurie and Alex returns with her close friend and co-host of their podcast, Melanie Gibb and Melanie's boyfriend, David Warwick. 
Laurie's friend Melanie Gibb and her boyfriend was uh, in Rexburg to attend an event and stay with her for the weekend. Laurie tells Melanie upon her arrival that JJ has become a zombie and has been behaving very oddly. As I arrived on the Thursday, she had said that he had turned into a zombie the day before I got there. And she was pointing out behaviors of his, like, look how he's doing this, that's unusual, or look how he's doing that. And she was trying to create um, uncertainty in me about what I saw his behavior. Like, she, what do you call that? Like, um, a doubt. doubt. A doubt. Um, and I was looking at him, and I thought, well, I... I don't know, he kind of looks like JJ to me, you know, hyper and angry one minute and kind of chill or crying the next minute. Like that's how his behaviors always were around me. I don't know if they were always like that, but that's how I noticed him when, when I was around both of them. Um, and she just gave me a few scenarios of different things he would say um, that sounded a little unusual. I didn't hear him say it, but she had, you know, she'd share things like he said this or he said that. When asked about Tylee, Laurie told Melanie that she was at BYU. Later in an investigation, it was found that Tylee Ryan was never a student at BYU. So at this point, Tylee had been missing for over two weeks. During her stay at Laurie's house, Melanie never saw Tylee. Laurie, Alex and Chad, no one ever spoke of her. However, Laurie and Melanie spoke a lot about JJ. Laurie said that JJ was in their way of mission. So she needs to send him to his grandmother Kay. They also discussed about other relatives they can send JJ to. Laurie didn't want to keep JJ with her. Like this is where it was heading and it's not a good place. On Sunday, September 22, 2019, Alex Chad, Melanie Gibb, and her boyfriend David Warwick went to see a piece of land on Chad's property in Salem. Melanie said something something to the effect of that Chad wanted to build a church or a building in his backyard or that David Warwick was interested in buying the land. Whatever may be the reason, they were at Daybell property day before JJ went missing. Same Sunday evening, Laurie, Melanie Gibb and David Warwick recorded their podcast between 9pm until midnight. During the podcast, they saw Alex carrying JJ in his arms. JJ was asleep. Next morning, Monday 23rd September, David asks about JJ and Laurie replies that JJ has become a zombie and Alex took him. Where? No one asks. Strange, right? The entire group is strange. JJ doesn't go to school that day. Next day, Tuesday, Laurie withdraws JJ from Kennedy Elementary School, indicating that she will homeschool him. Same day, 24th September, Laurie tells JJ's babysitter that her service is no longer needed as JJ has gone to stay with his grandmother. 24th September was also Tylee's 17th birthday. She had been missing for 17 days and her brother JJ for two days. Four days after Tylee's birthday, her brother Colby sends her a text. Hey Ty, happy birthday. I'm so proud of you. I know you have been through a lot. Trust God, it's gonna be okay. He gets a reply from Tylee's number. Thanks, Cobes. I love you. Colby later on said that those texts didn't seem like Tylee as she used a lot of emoticons and whenever he would want to FaceTime or call her, she would give excuses, which wasn't like her. October 1st, 2019, Laurie Vallow rents a 10 by 10 storage unit in Rexburg. In surveillance videos, she is seen visiting the storage a total of 9 times in October and once in November. The storage was full of Tylee and JJ's belongings. Two men along with Laurie visited the storage. One appeared to be Alex Cox and other, of course, Chad Bell. Janice Cox, Laurie's mother, claims that she spoke to JJ on 1st October, which was like... October 2nd, 2019, her minor kids are missing, but Laurie Vallow is browsing for wedding rings on Amazon. She buys Malachite's gemstone wedding ring from her ex-husband, Charles Card. Shameless. 
Next day, she was browsing for wedding dresses. This loving mother has so many things to take care of. This one is such a BS. On October 3rd, 2019, Chad Daybell was doing some yard work, sweating it out, digging holes, I don't know. So while he was doing his thing, Tammy's deceased grandmother, Grandma Cooper, comes to him and tells him that Tammy needs to go and see her parents in Springville. So Chad runs in and tells her that she needs to go because Grandma Cooper wants her to. But Tammy was hesitant because she never traveled without Chad or her children before. But Chad had this vision. So she got in her car next day and drove to Springville alone. Um, she believed that Tammy was going to pass away, though, before she got up there. And that didn't happen. She didn't pass away before she got up there. And so I thought, you know, I said, aren't you uncomfortable? Maybe he'll see, she'll see you guys together. And so... I thought it was different, you know, that she was going to be up there when he, when she was, Tammy was still alive. And she told you, well, Tammy will die before I move up there. Right. How was she going to die? I, I, have, I, I heard a few times maybe through a car accident or something like that. So they thought Tammy would be in a car crash. Yeah. Would pass away, then Lori would move up there, and then she could marry Chad. Mm -hmm. And when that didn't happen, she said, I've still got to go. Yeah, because, you know, the other side of the veil she's talking to, she says, I need to be there by this date. And she's communicating with someone. Someone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So she moves up there. And from what I understand, she and Chad would walk around the track at BYU, Idaho, holding hands, maybe kissing, you know, just displaying, looking like a married couple. Well, she told me that they did walk around uh, the track together. She didn't tell me what they did or didn't do, but I did have an opportunity to walk with them. And then we walked around and looked at the different pictures. I'd never been there before, so I saw the pictures that were in the gymnasium, or, you know, behind it where they have those beautiful pictures. So we talked and we walked, and yeah, they were... I was surprised. I'm like, aren't you worried that people are going to see you? And she says, well, Tammy doesn't come out a lot. She doesn't come over to this part a lot, so... But they were openly affectionate. Yeah, and they said a lot of people that didn't that new Chad didn't know what Tammy looked like because they didn't do a lot of the things together. So let me quickly tell you about Chad's prediction. He predicted that his wife, Tammy, will die soon, not because she's a dark soul or a zombie, but because she has a higher purpose to fulfill on other side of the veil. And for greater cause, that is the mission Chad and Laurie were to carry on. How convenient. Listen to this. He also predicted that Tammy will die in a car accident. But to his surprise, she drives back home safely. I'm wondering, this might have frustrated both Laurie and Chad because they were trying, sorry, not trying, they were dying to be together, even if that means other people dying surrounding them. October 9th, just 10 days before her death, Tammy files a report with Fremont Sheriff's Office that she was attacked by a paintball gun in her driveway by a masked man. What are the odds? She also wrote a Facebook post. Okay, neighbors, something weird just happened and I want you to know so that you watch out. I had gotten home and parked in our front driveway. As, a, as I was getting stuff out, a guy wearing ski mask was suddenly standing by the back of my car with a paintball gun. He shot at me several times, although I don't think it was loaded. I yelled for Chad and he ran off around back of the house. So the investigation was done on the matter and they thought that it was just a prank played by someone maybe by someone who was frustrated who that might be this attack was not done to kill tammy but maybe to scare her or to take out frustration on her for not dying on her way back from springwell oh someone is vengeful and desperate the off-putting lovers maybe just saying on 19th october Tammy Daybell suspiciously dies in her sleep. She was a healthy woman with no medical conditions. According to Chad, she went to bed coughing and never woke up. The family refused autopsy and no autopsy was done on this healthy woman to know the cause. Red flags, y'all. Red flags. 
Her body was laid to rest in Springville Cemetery on 22nd of October. Nine days after Tammy Daybell's death, Chad published an essay titled Moving On to the Second Half of My Life. In the LDS AVAO Global Initiative newsletter, Chad is already on his high horse, ready to leave or ready to move on. He wrote, My dear wife Tammy passed away in her sleep early Saturday, October 19. When I awoke at around 6 a.m., it was clear she had been gone for several hours. It came as a shock. I couldn't believe I hadn't been awoken somehow. But all indications are that her spirit simply slipped away during the night. Her face looked serene with her eyes closed and a slight smile. It was so devastating to discover her that way. But I'm so grateful that her death was peaceful. End quote. It seems he forgot to mention the pink froth coming from her mouth. His children did. But all Chad saw was a slight smile on her face. He was a course grateful that her death was peaceful as it got him four hundred and thirty thousand dollars in life insurance who wouldn't be thankful for that amount of money sometime in late october laurie invites chad and his children over to her townhouse and bakes cookies for them around the same time laurie and chad starts telling people that her daughter tylee had died a couple of years ago and that Laurie doesn't have any minor children. October 28, 2019, Laurie and Alex's niece, Melanie Boudreaux, moves to Rexburg, Idaho, just next door to Laurie. So, little background on niece. She had recently divorced her husband of 11 years and was into a custody battle for their children. She was very close to Alex and Laurie and was deeply involved in this close-knit, secretive group. Her ex-husband, Brandon Boudreaux, was shot at in his driveway by an unknown assailant just a couple of weeks before she moved. The shooter was driving Tylee Ryan's 2018 Jeep Wrangler, which was registered in Charles Vallow's name. Charles Vallow is dead. Tylee Ryan is missing. Who else could have had access to the vehicle? Hmm? Of course, Laurie and Alex. And how could Melanie have benefited from her husband's death? Question mark. No rocket science here. It was insurance money and custody of her children. Just like her aunt, Laurie. November 5th, 2019. Laurie and Chad Daybell gets married in Kauai, Hawaii. Just 17 days after his former wife, Tammy Daybell, died unexpectedly. Very shady business. Newly married doomsday couple comes back to Rexburg sometime in mid-November. November 24th, Laurie Vallow and a man, very likely Chad Day Bell, goes back to her rented storage unit for the last time. They drop off bike, photo albums with pictures of children, winter clothing and other items that belong to Tylee and JJ. One blanket with pictures of JJ and another with pictures of Tylee. November 25th, Kay Woodcock, Charles' sister, and JJ's bio-grandmother hacks into Charles' email account and finds an email regarding the Amazon purchase made by Laurie for her wedding ring. The receipt had delivery address to Laurie's Rexburg townhouse. Kay Woodcock quickly requested a welfare check on JJ. Remember, they had not been in touch for months now. Gilbert Peedy got in touch with Rexburg Police Department and they were sent to Laurie's townhouse. On November 26th, investigators knocked at apartment 175 to conduct the welfare check. Laurie wasn't home, but her brother Alex and her fifth husband was at the house. They inquire about JJ and Uncle Alex says that he was with his grandmother Kay Woodcock which can't be because she was the one who requested the welfare check. So they asked how they can get hold of Laurie, and Chad, her fifth husband, acted as if he didn't know who Laurie was very well, and stated he didn't have her number. Strange. Then Alex Cox says, oh, Laurie might be in apartment 107. So when all this was going on, and investigators were headed towards 107, they see Chad Dumble trying to drive away with tail between his legs. Coward. They stop him and ask him, 
about JJ. It's then Chad says that he last saw JJ at apartment 107 in month of October. But remember how he has been telling people that his brand new wife doesn't have any minor children. Liar, liar, pants on fire. At that point, uh, they couldn't get hold of her. Meanwhile, Chad calls their friend Melanie Kibb and tells her do not talk to police. That's the first thing a person guilty of doing something would say. Same day, late morning, detectives get hold of Laurie at apartment 175. She is at the house with her brother Alex Cox and Chad possibly already fled the scene. Coward! She tells them that JJ is in Gilbert, Arizona with their friend Melanie Kibb and they are at Movie Frozen. So many holes in their story, so many. We're here. Oh, this is a big mess. I just talked to the guy on the phone. What did he ask you? He was just saying that he wanted to do a well check on JJ. So JJ will be where? He's in Arizona. <laughs> Who's he with in Arizona? He's with one of my friends in Arizona. Oh. Hi. Oh. Hey. You got a notepad? No. Want me to get one? Uh, Wait. no, no. Come here. It's, you mind if he comes in? No, come on. So, Thank you. Sorry. Who's I'm the sorry. friend he's with? My friend Melanie. Her Melanie. son has autism. Her name is Melanie Gibbs. I gave him all the information on the phone. Okay, so he can call him? Yeah. Huh? This part. Yeah. What is all this? We're, we're a little what concerned. Why? Because, well, the officers who were here earlier yeah. were checking and they got a bad vibe. They, like something was going on here because uh, nobody knew anything about a child. They went and talked to him. It's because a uh, lot of stuff on? has gone on. If you want to know, it's a lot of stuff. So. Well, that's why we're concerned because very, it just was kind of weird. It is very weird. I've had to move around a lot. One of my brothers is trying to kill me. Not the brother that lives here, obviously. He's kind of my protector. My other brother that was in with my husband who was trying to kill me for my two million dollar life insurance policy. No. Right. Well, no. <laughs> so a lot of stuff has gone on in this last year. It's been a horrible year for us. I've had to move around. And so I was gonna move back to Arizona, put my son back into school there because I tried to put him in school here, public school at Kennedy. Okay. He went for two months, we tried it, but he had such a hard time. Now the person who called is my sister-in-law but she's his natural grandmother he's adopted by us okay so her son yeah. who is a drug addict okay. had a baby with a girl who's a drug addict and they took him from you know cps took him okay. gave him to the grandmother she came about him and then she wanted us to adopt him which we did we loved by him us. And him. my him? husband and i who died earlier this year okay he passed away. Since he oh, passed yeah. away, she's been trying to fight me for him and being really horrible to me and that kind of stuff. The she's kind of the paternal friend. Okay, thank you. That makes it That's so what hard. I mean. <laughs> the paternal grandmother. Yes, he has autism and ADHD. He has he doesn't really talk to people. Like he's he's very special needs. So I had him in a special needs school there. She was trying to so what happened was my husband who we were married for 15 years and had raised all these five kids together, switched his life insurance policy to her, right? To, <laughs> to his sister, okay. who got a million dollars when he died, and we got nothing for me to raise JJ, and all the kids got nothing, and everybody got nothing. She got a million dollars. So I knew she was going to try to sue me for him or. JJ? Yeah, because she now has this million dollars, so she can hire people to help. And I have nothing. Like, but you have nothing. legal custody. He's my son. I adopted him. Right. He was two years. We had him from the time he was eight months old until mm -hmm. two years old. So she does nothing who wants to cause me trouble. So I don't tell people the truth about where we are and what we're doing because of those reasons. So I look like a suspect, but I am not a good person. Raised all Funny. Same friend Chad called and asked not to talk to police. Laurie separately calls Melanie Gibb and tells her to go to a movie theater and click a picture of a random kid that looked like JJ. Detectives try to reach Melanie Gibb but can't get hold of her so Rexburg Police Department calls Gilbert Police Department so they can go and check on her at her house. But she was out of town and that day they couldn't locate her. 
Next day on 27th of November, Gilbert PD requests Rexburg PD to search Laurie's apartment. When they reach with search warrant, surprise, surprise, lovebirds have already fled the nest. Laurie Valo and Chad Debel were gone. They left Rexburg the same night. If that's not suspicious. At this point, detectives are very concerned, not just for JJ, but also for 17-year-old Tylee. They ask neighbors and look for any possible witness who have seen the kids recently. And their findings were that Tylee had been missing since 8th of September and was last seen at Yellowstone National Park. And JJ was withdrawn from his elementary school on September 23rd. Big discovery, kids have been missing for two months and people who may have the answers ran off. Laurie Vallow and Chad Debel were gone the previous night. Alex Cox moves back to Arizona and Melanie Boudreaux was with her new love interest for Thanksgiving in a different city. All three apartments were raided and searched. Laurie left all her belongings back. Alex's door was broken into. Melanie Boudreaux's electronics were seized. They learned about Chad's property in Salem just 10 minutes drive away. They go there and finds out that his wife had recently passed away in her sleep. Like what? Kids are missing and wife is dead and everyone runs away. What the F is going on? They learn about the storage unit in Rexburg, which was last visited by Laurie and a man. I mentioned it earlier. They take out search warrant on that and finds things that belong to the missing kids. While this was going on in Rexburg, back in Arizona, detectives get hold of Laurie's older son, Colby. They ask him about his siblings and he has no clue what's going on. After they leave, he calls his mother to ask what is going on and she says, oh well, I'll take care of it and ask what detectives were asking. That was a Thanksgiving weekend between the dates of 28th November and 1st December, Chad was with his family in Southern California. A few, a few pictures were posted on social media in support of that. And Laurie wasn't with him, but she was lying low somewhere. On November 29th, just two days after the apartments were raided in Rexburg, Alex Cox marries a woman by name Zulema Pastines in Chapel of Love, Las Vegas. And guess what? He changes his last name from Cox to Pastiness. Wedding lasted 8 minutes and they appeared gold. On 30th November, the next day, his niece Melanie Boudreaux and her new love interest Ian Pulowski gets married in Lucky Little Chapel, Las Vegas. She also changes her last name from Boudreaux to Pulowski. Oh, that was unexpected. And her uncle, now Alex Pastiness, signs as the witness. A couple of days ago, their houses were raided. Kids have been missing for two months, but it was important for them to get married first. Everything else can wait. What a family. Or is it that they ran from Rexburg and quickly got married and changed their last names to avoid being traced? Police were looking for Alex Cox and Melanie Boudreau, not Alex Pastines and Melanie Pulowski. What kind of normal people do that? And people say it's not a cult. Look at their extreme behavior so in correspondence to each other, covering for each other. In midst of all these confusion, newly married, Laurie and Chad flies to Hawaii on December 1st, 2019. December 6th, the close friend Melanie Gibb, the entire department was trying to locate, finally gets in touch with Rexburg PD and tells them that she was called by both Laurie and Chad separately asking her to lie to law enforcement. December 8, Melanie Gibb calls Chad's number and speaks to Laurie. She recalls the entire conversation. My opinion, it sounded more like she was trying to disassociate herself in a weird way, trying to prove a point that, oh well, I was close to you guys, but I had no part in whatever you did. Again, my opinion. It didn't sound like, hey, where are the kids? Are they safe? What happened to them? Yeah, there was part of it, not so much. More like, I don't want to get in trouble. No, no. She is a key witness to this case and has helped a lot. I think she mostly stayed in the periphery of this secret group or 
maybe she is giving that impression we don't know Hello, sweet Melanie. Hi, Chad. Hey, Murray. Hi. Hey, let me put that speaker. Oh, okay. All right. We're on episode phone. <laughs> How are you guys? We're okay. How are you doing, babe? I'm doing pretty good, thanks. I was wondering, yep. where, where are you guys? We're just hanging out. Hanging out? <laughs> are, you, are you in Idaho? We're no. in Idaho. <laughs> okay. Um, I just wanted to ask you a question if you don't mind, Lori. Yeah, um, I want to know, um, you remember we talked about JJ going to Kay's house and you told me they went there and now he's not there? I was wondering what happened. Well, I had to move him somewhere else because of her actions. <laughs> So, was she, was she doing something? Like, was she trying to come get him or something? Or, like, trying to kidnap him? Well, she's, yeah, she said that lots of times before, but, um. Okay, I, well, you know, when I asked Chad the other day, I was like, hey, um, you know, where, where is JJ? And he said, for my security, he didn't want me to know, so is there a reason I should be in danger to know where he is? <laughs> No, it's nobody. It's his danger. It's the danger that there's people after me. Okay. So we just felt it, that if you knew, that puts you in a danger. Well, just in a bad position. Yeah, bad position. Everybody, right. if they don't know anything, then they don't have to say they know. Right. So you're just worried. Okay. Um, I'm just to keep him protected and. And keep you protected. And keep yeah. everybody else. Yeah. I appreciate that. Um, well, I was wondering why you told the police why he was with me. I just needed to use, have somebody that I, so I wouldn't have to tell them where he really was because they were going to tell Kay where he is. Oh, yeah. So is it, do you think it's like your family or, you know, like your family, your dad or, you know, those well, my people? my family. Well, not my whole family, but you know, as you know, most of my family is working against me and yeah. with her, basically. Yeah. Is JJ safe? He is safe and happy. Okay, well, that's good to hear. Um, are you afraid of anything? Like, are you afraid to tell me that you're just afraid that he... Um, that I could be in danger, like you're, you know, like I don't, like if I knew, like how could that hurt me? I don't understand how that could hurt me if I knew where he was. Well, I'm just not telling anybody so that nobody has to say where he is or get questioned to where he is so I can keep him as safe as possible. Yeah. Um, okay, I hope, well, I hope that he's okay. I hope you guys are okay. I did have a question that I asked Al at one point, your brother, um, if um, if I wanted to know, you know, um, like where he was, and he said I did not want to know, and that he could not be found. So what does that mean? I don't know why he would say that, but it's the same story. Like I, yeah. I. I don't even want Al to know. I don't want anybody to know so that nobody has to be worried about it. I mean, nobody has to be yeah. questioned about it so he can be safe. Yeah, so are you, I mean, are you, how, how long are you going to be away for? Like, how, I mean, are you ever going to be able to come out and come back to society again? Or are you going to keep, you know, like, come back? I mean, like, what does that look like? I know it sounds like it. I'm just worried for you guys because, you know, he's missing and, you know. <laughs> I know exactly where he is. He's okay. perfectly fine and happy. Okay, well, I hope so. Okay. I, have, I have a script for darkness now. Darkness is knocking on the door all the time because that's the way dark works with the light. And I promise you, 
that I have done nothing wrong in this case, but sometimes you have to hide in the cavity of a rock for your own life safety. And that's what the Lord requires of you sometimes. And that's how it is. And I'm sorry that's how it is because there is a lot of darkness on the earth. I don't know. This thing after me for zero reason besides the darkness of Kay, which you already know she's dark. I, I, ha- I haven't met her enough to know if she's dark or not. I've just met her slightly, and she seemed like a normal kind of person, but then I haven't engaged with her that much, so I don't know that personally. So you don't know about her changing the thing to for herself to be the beneficiary of the policy and all that stuff? None of that's dark, right? Well, I haven't seen those documents, so I have no way of knowing. You've seen them on my computer? No, I have not. I haven't even looked in on your computer before. Show me. I don't know why you're being controversial to me or if you're recording this conversation for the police or whatever. I don't know what your intention is on this phone call. Well, but no. with all my heart, and I have forever, and yeah. I will always be. I appreciate those words, but if you really loved me, you wouldn't have told the police that I had JJ with me. That's not, that's not what a friend does. I mean, that just makes me look weird, and it, it just... It's not safe for me. That doesn't look good. I mean, you had to think of my welfare if you loved me. I do, and I did exactly what I felt the Lord was instructing me to do. And I appreciate you, and I love you. And I never do anything to harm you. And you can have all of this confirmed to you by the Lord. I have. And my, my conscience is clear. I feel very understanding what's really going on, Lori. And I believe that, look, I believe that you have been very deceived by Satan. I believe that he has tricked you. And I just, I don't believe that what you're doing is correct. I just don't, I mean, Tammy dies, and then your husband died, and then these, and then he's missing. It just doesn't sound like God's plan to me just sounds it gives me a gut feeling like in my gut it feels weird it doesn't feel right i don't have peace about it i never have felt 100 percent peace about it i always felt like a little weird in my stomach about all these things you know me mel you know me this does not sound like you this sounds like you've been influenced by somebody dark who wants you to believe dark things and have fear and have fear of the celestial world I don't have fear. You obviously do. No, I have a piece of conscience and I can see clearly. Well, I'm sorry that you feel that way. I love you so much. I know you do. 10th December, Laurie and Chad moves into a condo in Kauai. The owner was told that they don't have any kids and Chad is a writer who needs a peaceful place to write his books. So I cannot verify this one but they moved into the complex across the street from where Laurie and Charles used to stay. If that's true, this woman is ice cold. Very next day on 11th December, Chad Daybell's former wife, Tammy Daybell's body is exhumed and is sent in for an autopsy. Remember the family refused an autopsy and burial was done very quickly? So at this point, an obvious foul play is suspected and this sudden death is seen as a possible first degree homicide. Guess what happens next day? On 12th December, the family hitman Alex Cox, sorry, Alex Pastiness dies mysteriously, suspiciously at the house that he shared with his new wife of two weeks. What on earth is going on in this family? Like, what? Late afternoon that day, Zulema Bastines, 25-year-old son, calls 911 after he discovers Alex unconscious on the bathroom floor. Zulema's son didn't know Alex's last name, nor his age, nor he knew that he was his mother's husband. He kept saying, my mother's boyfriend. That raises so many questions on this marriage. Was it for love? Hell no. Or was it to save his ass? Definitely guilty of something. Something that has to do with the kids. So this is 911 call from that day. 911, where is your emergency? Hi, I need an ambulance to... 
Um, I have uh, a older male here named Alex. He's uh, he just passed out here on the on my on my bathroom. Okay, is he awake right now? I think he's passed out. Okay, you think he's unconscious? Yes. Okay, is he breathing normally? Like you can see his chest rising and falling. Hello. I hope so. I have the paramedics on the way, but I need you to try to help me with some information while they're driving there to help him. Okay. Okay. How old is he? Uh, he seems to be in his 40s. Okay. Do you know him? No, it's my mother's boyfriend. Okay. And how old are you? I'm 25. Okay. I have the paramedics on the way, so he's in the restroom right now? Okay. Gilbert, can we get you started? I'm already in route. All right, thank you. Okay, is he on his back or on his stomach? Where is he at? He's on his side. Okay. Can you lay him flat on his back on the ground? Um, I'll try. It's just there's feces there, and I'm trying to just keep cool right now. Um, you said he's what? There's feces on the ground. His... Okay. I know that's gross, but if we can just go ahead and get him flat on his back, I want to make sure he's right. breathing, because if he's not, we're going to do a few things. Gotcha. Did you say he's cool, like cold? Alex. Alex. Alex, you got to get you on your back. Alex. Does he seem more awake or more asleep? He's more passed out. Okay. Is he opening his eyes or moving at all? He's breathing. Okay, is he breathing normally, like his chest is rising and falling? He's not making any weird sounds? Yeah, he's uh, making a very exhale sound like... Okay, if he's doing that, we need to start CPR, so I need you to get him flat on his back on the ground. Okay, I'll do that. Let me know when he's flat on his back, and we're going to give you instructions, okay? Okay. Uh, what is your first name? No, he's too big. Okay, just try to get him on his back so we can do chest compression. My, my mother just got here. Okay, give her the phone then. So, did she say the mother just got there? Yeah. Come here, come here. And we're coming on mineral right now. Really we're bad. almost there. It's really bad. Come up there in the bathroom. We need to get him on his back. Can you put your mom on the phone? She's, up, she's right here. You're on speaker. Okay, ma'am. The paramedics are pulling up, but in the meantime, we need him to get flat on his back, and we need to give him chest compressions, okay? Chest compressions. Wait. But, Does she know how to do CPR? Yes. She knows how. Okay. How far are you? Melanie and Gib had already snitched on Laurie and Chad and Alex knew a lot about whatever was going on. After Tammy's body was exhumed, did that make him very nervous that he couldn't even take a peaceful dump? First they were looking for children and now they are digging graves. By mid-December, Ellie had all the reasons to believe that this family is shady as hell and children have disappeared, not in a good way. By end of December, Rexburg Police Department issued a press release stating that they know that the children are not with Laurie Vallow and Chad Daybell and these two knows either the location of children or what has happened to them. On January 3rd, 2020, Rexburg PD and FBI raids Chad Daybell's house in Salem. They collect 43, collected 43 items of interest that included computers, documents, medications, and one of those was Tammy Daybell's phone. So everyone is looking for Tylee and JJ. The law enforcement JJ's grandparents put up a reward of 20k for any information on children and Laurie's son. Colby made YouTube appeals to his mother, but on her end, silence, not a word. Chad's side of the family, just his brother, 
Matt, to be clear, released statements asking his brother to come forward and cooperate with the investigation. Again, silence. Chad doesn't want to talk. January 25th, 2020, Lori was asked to produce her children physically to law enforcement. She didn't respond. They were enjoying stays at fancy resorts before moving into a condo. Room with a great view booked under the name of Lori Ryan. Ryan was her third husband's last name. But later in one of the court hearings, she emphasized that she wanted to be addressed as Mrs. Daybell, just saying. They were going to beaches, buying alcohols, getting groceries, enjoying in pool and doing all the newly married things, possibly giggling <laughs> how they successfully outplayed the law enforcement. But I tell you, they were being watched closely. On 26 January 2020, next day after she was asked to produce the kids, both Lori and Chad were strolling outside Kauai Beach Resort. enjoying their bright sunny day when Kauai police department and federal agents served them with search warrants love birds were separated and put in back seat of two different cars their rental car was towed away and they served them with another search warrant for the condo kids were not with them they were allowed to go and no arrests were made meanwhile kay would cock appealed to lorry she said Lori, if you have an ounce of compassion left in your entire body, please produce the kids. So when asked about this, all Lori said was, "That's great." Lori and Chad they started switching hotels. It was around this time when they were approached by East Idaho News at the parking lot. Doomsday couple was going to the beach with their beach stuffs. They asked them about the kids and all she said was, No comments. How unaffected and thick-skinned these two are. I'm truly amazed in a very negative way. On January 27, 2020, hopeful grandparents Kay and Larry Woodcock filed a petition for the guardianship of JJ and expressed that they also wanted to take in Tylee, although they had no legal custody rights over her. So when missing kids are found they were to be placed with the states then with the Woodcocks. I really wanted to talk about this because there were people who really loved these kids and wanted best for them. It's extremely sad case. On 30 January the deadline day Lori was supposed to present herself and the kids in the court. All major news channels flew to Rexburg in anticipation to see the kids. Cult mom never showed up. If that doesn't add to the wariness of the situation with the well-being and safety of the kids. 12th February, 13 days after she was asked to produce her kids, Keith Morrison, the Dateline host, is tipped that Lori and Chad have packed their bags and were preparing to leave for Mexico. On 20th February 2020, Lori Vallow Daybell was arrested on two felony counts of desertion and non-support of dependent children and other misdemeanor charges. She was held on 5 million bond. March 5th, Lori Vallow is extradited to Idaho. Chad also comes back to Rexburg, Idaho. Honeymoon is over, people. She manages to get her bond reduced to 1 million dollars. So I will briefly touch on that. She didn't had 1 million dollars nor the cult daddy had that money. So there are bail bond companies you can reach out to and at 10% they will bail you out. So for 1 million dollars she had to pay 100,000 dollars to the company. If the company and the individual comes to an agreement the bail bond company would have had been responsible if Lori runs away she has a history for that or didn't show up for her court hearings. or she didn't abide by the laws also something to pay attention to 1 million dollars is a huge amount and in this case one husband is dead one wife is dead both under suspicious circumstances you have two missing children for months now and the way she was running away from the law enforcement it was a stinky deal even though it was a high profile case her team reached out to companies and at least two straight up declined like no we don't want to work with her 
Mid-March, Chandler PD opens up investigation on Charles Vallow's shooting. Everything was coming together. These two were bad, bad news. Not just Charles Vallow, detectives were also looking into the death of Joseph Ryan, her third husband. April 1st week, an investigation on Laurie Vallow and Chad Daybell has begun in regards to Tammy Daybell's death. It is investigated on the lines of their roles in conspiracy, attempted murder or murder. They are in deep, deep ditch. Still, these two were tight-lipped about the whereabouts of the kids. JJ and Tylee were being searched for. Clearly, Laurie and Chad didn't have them. Concerns for their safety was more pronounced now. They are two minor children. They can't take care of themselves, and especially JJ being a special need. The idea of doomsday also came to light, so people speculated and really hoped that kids were somewhere hidden alive and safe. But common sense would say otherwise. The Rexburg Police Department, Fremont County Sheriff's Department and the FBI came together and structured a plan a week prior to executing search warrant on Chad Daybell's property in Salem for the second time. June 9, 2020 Early morning, detectives got on front door of Chad Daybell's house. Door was answered by his sons, who led them to Chad's room. He was served the warrant while he sat in the kitchen. All I'm wondering is, he is the chosen one, a prophet who knows what is to come, and he never saw this coming, huh? While team is searching the property, by property I mean the outside, earlier on January 3rd, his house, his house was searched. This search was on bare land, bushes, ponds in the property. I know this doesn't sound good. So while team was on it, Chad was sitting in his car in the driveway, keeping his beady eyes on every move they were making, every place they were digging. Okay, so this one is going to be a hard one, so disclaimer. There is a small dried up pond situated in north of Daybell property, so by the pool is a tree. The cadaver dogs found a lead and team started digging up the patch of land. As they were digging, they came to three flat rocks, something like a slate laid down in a, in a line. On further digging, they found uh, black garbage bags and inside was a uh, tightly wrapped little body of JJ covered in duct tapes. The search for the missing seven-year-old came to an unfortunate discovery. So Chad was watching it all. When they were digging in the area of the pond and after they found JJ's remain, Chad tried to take off. He was stopped and taken into, into custody at the traffic stop. Such a coward. He had balls to even try to escape because last time I was informed he didn't have any. Daybell property has pet cemetery where they used to bury their pets. Teams started excavating around the area and they found several pieces of charred flesh and bones scattered and buried in the area. These were the remains of 16 year old Tylee. All the while, everyone was looking for their children, worried to their guts. These two, Laurie Vallow Daybell and Chad Daybell, were living their life like nothing was wrong. The manner in which the remains were found is extremely disturbing. They were disposed of like they were nothing. Laurie Vallow was collecting social security benefits for both the kids while they were buried in her lover Chad Daybell's backyard. This woman is sick. JJ and Tylee had their entire life ahead of them. They didn't deserve this. No one in this case deserved to die. Not Charles, not Tammy. Laurie could have sent JJ to live with his grandparents. Tylee would have started college soon and moved out. Charles filed for divorce, but Laurie manipulated him into withdrawing it. He could have been on his way with JJ. Chad would have separated from Tammy. Who knows, maybe she would have been alive if it, this wasn't a murder. This was a murder, if allegedly. If allegedly. All this for what? Money, madness, and delusional sense of pride? The chosen ones born to lead 144,000 into new world crap? Try this gathering behind the bars, you jailbirds. They are going to beat the shit out of you.
child killers. I hope inmates do beat them black and blue. <laughs> I'm getting all so riled up now. So with this, we come to an end of Laurie Vallow and her five husband series. Already people are doing great very informative podcasts and videos on this case. So if I find something new and interesting about this case no one has touched on, I'll sure to make an episode on that. For next episode, I'll be coming up with a bizarre case where wife liked wearing clothes of her wacko husband's victims. Crazy. My eyeballs just popped out. Let me go and look. Thank you so much for being here. Please do subscribe for more digging into such cases. Thank you for being here.